as you will see, positions itself seamlessly between architecture and conceptual art with operations that reposition many quotidian ideas or objects such as a roof or a chair and tie new perspectives on form and experience for viewers or participants that were almost certainly overlooked by our familiarity with them. We are so pleased to have Erin as our guest for our lecture series this quarter. Please join me in welcoming her. So I guess maybe we can say that everything in architecture is a kind of very 
variation of something that's come before. This is an image from the original, uh, or the first rooms exhibition at PS1. There's a pretty amazing exhibition catalog that you guys can look at. But this is, this. so this is the attic of the old public school building, and this artist, Ned Smith, basically put a table in it and photographed it and called it The Last Supper. So um, there wasn't, because it sort of evoked some sort of church imagery or religious imagery, I guess, but there, there's not actually work, work, like let's say, being installed, but really sort of repurposing or reforming the space into something. So we kind of looked at this problem of repetition and reuse of the old school building as something to push through the project. So sort of disciplinary conversations, the idea of reuse and repetition um, have been mostly rooted in problems surrounding the repurposing of architectural ideas or, or copying, right? And at least historically, the form of repetition has been given a kind of negative valence, right? People don't like to admit all the time that they're referencing or reusing ideas from the past, even though oftentimes that's a pretty good way to begin talking about a project and open up a conversation. But on the other hand, in conversations about the practice of architecture, these terms sort of now almost exclusively address the handling of physical materials like lead certification and you get sort of like flat and gold and silver stars for reusing and recycling and things. So we saw there's this is a kind of like just the issues of reuse and re refitting. There was sort of a divide between how the sort of discipline of architecture looks at those things and how the practice does, where one sees it as a sort of negative thing and the other as a kind of positive. So um, for PS1 we thought that this problem of like was located primarily in the roof, where the roof sort of architecturally, I guess, the architectural object object that does the most work to sort of fit things together is the roof. We can kind of have any or any arrangement of sort of things under one roof, and the roof is expected to adjust and refit and, um, I don't know, kind of make account for any differences that might occur in the plan. Um, so PS1's roof in particular, this is the building, um, there's like an old wing and a new wing, and they sort of come together at some point under one roof. Um, and the roof was actually a kind of conglomeration of different types of roofs, or um, like if you look at this diagram, there's many of these things coming together at PS1. So there's not really a clear roof form, there's just many different forms coming together. The roof also, I guess the interest in the roof is also that it sort of has a history of the social space. So these are corpse, or corpse projects, obviously. Um, so it provides not only inhabitable space above, but um, also below. So here is a playground, um, and a meeting, and then sort of roofscape, or the sort of relation between roof and landscape um, on the left. Um, and so the roof is also sort of a fundamental term in block party vernacular. So at PS1, the sort of party scene was something that the curators were very concerned about. The, installation has to provide uh, shade and seating for 5,000 people during their sort of summer concert series. So the idea of a party was something that they were, I don't know, super sort of invested in. And the, the roof finally, like when you sort of, you can you hear admonitions to raise the roof, tear the roof off, and even more hyperbolically, the roof is on fire. So it's interesting that these expressions combine the party scene with acts of architectural revision about the roof. So, the project takes the existing roof of OMO PS1 and refits it into the courtyard in order to kind of activate it as a social space across the spectrum of programs and experiences. From celebrity yoga to unrestrained celebration to the collection of construction materials and exhibitions using social media. Um, so in a sense, the roof is also the project. It was just a frame. It's also kind of like revealing or flaunting its underlayers layers sort of do in the summer. But what just sort of only working on the frame does is it reveals the sort of intersection of multiple forms of knowledge between architecture and construction and carpentry and these kinds of things. Um, so typically in modern culture we separate these people, we separate these forms of knowledge and even like uh, construction schedules are sort of staged so that these people don't cross, cross colony and they don't get in each other's way. Um, and so we saw this project as a sort of a platform to bring together multiple forms of knowledge at the same time. Totalizing scheme that filled out the entire courtyard with an object overhead while keeping the majority of the sort of ground um, open. So there's sort of 
multiple conditions that occur, roof overhead, frame below, um, only roof overhead, and then there was this dance deck that became a sort of important part of the project, um, not only for its sort of like associations with other, other projects, so this is Anna Halpern's dance deck. Do you guys know? But Lawrence was an architect, sort of, and Anna was a, a choreographer, an artist, um, sort of forms of conceptual body. But this was, these were other people that were sort of working on the completion between architecture and other forms of art, I guess. So the dance deck became a kind of um, a specific site in the project where all these sort of different programs could play out, not only the party scene, um, but also other forms of occupation. So the multiple uses of the deck, which we thought of through different kinds of fitness programs, I guess, suggested multiple forms of engagement. So the project looked at programming the deck out with sort of fitness scheduling. I guess another way to think about the problem of fit, right? Not just a kind of like a form fitting into another form or uh, you know, you're, you don't exactly fit into some cultural and social group, but also the idea of like actual fitness as in health. Um, so making fit as incorporating physical fitness is part of the summer programming agenda. Uh, so a portion of the project was posted on a website where the website sort of opened the space up of the exhibition and made it more social, sort of in terms of social media. Um, so really what the project was trying to do is to provide a venue for multiple forms of engagement, and in this case through scheduling and programming the deck with physical fitness classes. So this would all be sort of propelled by what we propose to be celebrity fitness trainers. So we, we wanted to kind of invite, uh, or the proposal involved inviting uh, people that were sort of already invested in the idea of fitness to host fitness classes at PS1. Um, they didn't really like that part, but there were, this sort of installation was supposed to span 11 weeks, so we kind of proposed one trainer for each week. Michael Meredith and Hillary Samples 
installation, which we called after party. But we we actually wanted to, at the end of the installation, make all the sort of specific materials available to the public for reuse and sort of recycling back into the community, I guess. Um, and then this concept of fitness also extended to the sort of on-site uh, water management. Um, so this drainage became a sort of important component, or it seemed to be something that they were incredibly concerned about on the site. Um, that there's a lot of rain in the summer in New York, and um, basically what we did was we took the sort of existing drainage lines from the existing roof around the building, and they got to refit into the courtyard as well. So we took something that was sort of typically considered an otherwise mundane aspect of exterior architectural drainage, the sort of gutters and downspouts, and kind of uh, turned it into a feature that provided water that was also sort of fit for use with the kind of filtering system for <laughs> the summer sort of physical fitness classes. Um, so I guess this, uh, well, that project was happening sort of at the same time as this project was developing, so ideas about like framing and fitness and involving publics were something something that sort of pushed through this project as well. So this project's called The Entire Situation, and this was my fellowship project. Started as my fellowship project at UCLA when I was a teaching fellow there two, two years ago, three years ago. Um, and it was first constructed at the MAP Center for Art and Architecture in Los Angeles. Um, and then it basically involved three rooms or three sets of walls. Um, and the project looked primarily at um, information that's kind of gained and lost when you move from a line defined by points, like uh, what, let's say what might be, how you might draw a curve in Rhino, to a kind of building information model, specifically Revit, which I think is interesting for a lot of reasons. So this is another sort of tool that's just kind of been relegated to practice that a lot of people kind of like, I don't know, on some level they dismiss conceptually, right? So BIM was initially developed by Charles Eastman, as he called it Building Description System, and uh, it was part of his sort of dissertation in 1975 that he called the use of computers instead of drawings in building design. And I think it's interesting how the software sort of deals with material thickness um, and also the sort of embedded catalog of components, right? So you're never just drawing a line. Has anybody used Revit? A lot of you guys have. Great. So you know you're never just drawing a line, right? It's always already some architectural component or, or it's always already like a structural grid or a door or a wall. Like it's, it's, uh, it's already embedded with these kind of logics of material use. Um, uh, the other thing about it that we thought was interesting was that BIM is typically, or has been called by many, or one person in particular, theorist named Mario Carpo, has been called it as a participatory Right? Like many people can be working on the same sort of digital model at once, and he sort of props that up as something that's really productive about it. Um, and it's more, makes it more efficient, and people can edit, live edit, and all this stuff. But I guess um, one thing we've been thinking about recently is that sort of the term participation in all of this, and I guess like just thinking, like, why, why is it like, why can everybody working on a BIM file even be called participation to begin with? accidentally delete something that you weren't supposed to or you kind of like mess it up in some way have you somehow like unparticipated um so anyway those are just some things you need out so this is more specifically about the project this is one, one of the rooms or a series of walls that sort of track the sidedness of a wall where how it kind of crosses over itself and how it's constructed when it reaches points in class so the project was really interested in the kind of like constructed backsides or the things that we're not typically supposed to care about, I guess, as architects, right? Just kind of trying to reclaim some of the space we typically give up to the contractor. So this other room dealt with the sort of construction of a point and plan, um, which presents problems when something that's defined only by location, like a point, is forced to confront material things. So this was all registered through the sort of appearance or disappearance of details in corners and it seems. Um, and through the use of joinery and carpet too, the molding sort of like does work to account for the difference in length between the front side of the wall and the back side of the wall, or the sort of decorated surface of the interior and the kind of framed practicality of the kind of exterior kind of construction. Um, yeah, or really just register the fact that the sort of inside of a wall and the outside of a wall are just not the same thing. Um, so not only are they 
finish differently, but they register different forms of knowledge and types of labor. So the stud spacing in the project is not typical. In some cases, there's clearly more than necessary, maybe even too many. But the way we were thinking about the studs was not just as a kind of part of a constructed wall system or rule of thumb or manufacturer cut sheets dictate spacing and alignment, but also as something that could begin to do more work to measure and mark the form um, and kind of embed the project with another layer of management and control. So you, if you were a close reader of the project, you could begin to understand um, the sort of, this, the, you could begin to read the spacing of the studs and account for the difference in measure between the back side of the wall and the front side of the wall and understand what the holding is doing and not need me to kind of explain it. So um, I guess the other part of the project is the fact that we call these mock-ups, architectural mock-ups, and the category of the mock-up has always been kind of curious to me and that it presents a kind of dilemma, right? So you have um, on the one hand, a mock-up can be understood as a kind of model and that it sort of precedes something else, but then at scale, the sort of one-to-one -one in architecture and use of actual building materials that sort of asserts its presence and veracity that this is the thing itself, uh, sort of begins to uh, begins to represent a problem for the concept of the model. So I, I guess the question of is it a model or is it the real thing is kind of something we've been thinking about. And it is that even like an important question to be asked today. So anyway, we ended up having to like mock up the mock up in a sense for ourselves, but also as a, a result of our relationship with our contract. He didn't think that the sort of drywall could bend like this. He didn't think that this we could sort of construct these things without ceiling. So there was a kind of, it was a way to kind of literally validate the work. So we built these rooms, not just in the MAC, but in our office too. We ended up building them like three times. And we thought we could be really sneaky and kind of send the drawings to the contractor ahead of time for pricing and then say, after you price them, and say, okay, we're only going to chip one side of the wall. So how much savings do we get? Um, well, because we thought that would be a lot less work and a lot less material, but actually what ended up happening was it kind of cost three times as much in the end because everything needed to sort of line up perfectly and the sort of segments of the track needed to align with the kind of like on center with the spacing of the studs. Um, and so there was like all of this, basically we were kind of forcing our you know, awesome contractor named Marcos Lozano, if you guys ever knew a great drywall contractor, <laughs> to care about things that he wasn't supposed to typically care about. Um, and to have his crew pay attention to things that they're typically not asked to pay attention to. And so the sort of job description of that labor force on some level needed to be edited a little bit, um, which escalated the price considerably. So the project was repeated again um, at the Vianney Chicago Architecture Biennial last year. Um, and one of the things we had been working on and thinking about coming off of the sort of PS1 project was that uh, we were sort of interested in issues related to access or making the project more accessible. So it did, wasn't just about, you know, conversations that only architects would care about, about construction or sort of disciplinary conversations about, well, the corner problem, which we didn't necessarily talk about, but that was something that was we were working on in, in the map. Um, but I guess opening up the conversation to a wider audience because of sort of the Chicago architecture biennial was taking place in one of the most public buildings in the downtown Chicago. Um, a building that when the biennial is not there is sort of, it's free and open to the public in the winter. It, sort of people that don't have anywhere else to go, go and sleep there because it's heated and that's the kind of like only place that won't keep them out. So there's a lot of people coming through the building that don't like, aren't interested and don't care, to be honest, like don't care about the sort of things that we care about in architecture, like miring holding so, um, so one of the really interesting and sort of unexpected things that came out of the previous project at the MAC was this idea of the template, um, or the fact that we had to use the template. Um, so the MAC wouldn't let us secure anything to the floor, um, so we had to come up with a base or just something for the walls to sit on, but eventually we kind of realized that they could be used more like templates, which was how they operated in this project in Chicago. So we were able to use them as something that could be embedded with a certain amount of information, or maybe they really just made a certain set of instructions more communicable to our contractor. So, which is a much different contractor than contractor in LA, which we were interested in. So Chicago is totally 
super unionized. So we weren't allowed, like we were allowed to get super close to the project and kind of control everything in LA, but in Chicago, they, like you can't do that. So the kind of working relationship with the builder was much, much different and we had to sort of give up some form of control, which was kind of interesting for us to figure out other ways to manage things. So the sort of the template became another form of quick onsite communication. Um, so the whole project and I guess what it's kind of come down to is like what happens when as architects we get sort of specific about things we're not supposed to care about. Things we're supposed to leave up to others that might have been relegated in this case to the realm of building. Um, so also part of the project installed on the wall across from the mock-ups at the biennial was a 65 inch touch screen running a web-based software called StudFinder. You guys can go to studfinder.org. Just don't go to studfinder.com. Um, so it was a really limited, bim or just don't do it here. Um, it was a really limited BIM-like software program where you can kind of draw a sketch or squiggle and it turned it into one of these stud wall rooms. But that's really the only thing it does. Um, so it resolves, or actually has a hard time resolving all these misalignments. And I guess what we were interested in this was like making, for us, making the project more accessible to a very wide, wide audience, from like adults to kids to architects and non-architects. But most people think they can never be architects because they can't, they're not creative or they can't talk, right? So it kind of the project kind of levels the playing field in a certain sense. Anyone can design a room, but not really any want and we kind of manage it and have so much control over it that this is the only thing they can do with it. So there's a really limited range of that. And we worked with um, a computational designer who has like a background in computer science and architecture. Architecture's name is Sue Taylor with Sue Bihar. He used to uh, work for Tom Main and do a lot of the sort of post-rationalization on Morpheus's projects. Um, and now he has his own sort of studio. Um, so I have a quick demo. So we got really interested in the kind of construction um, and the construction and trying to figure out ways to begin to do that, um, to begin to document it, I guess. And so we set up these GoPros in the space uh, and also had the construction workers wear them, um, which there's videos of later, but it basically set up a kind of surveillance system in the space. Um, and I guess we had heard right before we did this that recently, um, so Frank Gary has been working on his own house, and recently he's installed cameras on site, and he can sit in his office and just watch his house get built on these very like high-res screens. So there's a kind of like proximity to the project that he has that doesn't require him to be on site. So uh, because we've been thinking about like expertise and control and being close to the work, we thought that um, in Chicago, in a city that is totally sort of like unionizing. And certain levels manages architects' involvement in certain things. We thought that this idea of surveillance was interesting to think about. But anyway, we basically set up the surveillance system in the space and we kind of have hundreds of minutes of footage but of that. But what's most interesting to me um, are these moments when construction had to stop because the building was open to the public during this time, during the time of the installation. And there were various events like concerts and weddings and other things that happened during the day where we couldn't make noise. So this one of the workers, um, and there were these random breaks and everybody else left except for this guy. And um, he just like, it's it's a kind of weird, like I'm not sure what's going on, but it's a, to me it seems like a very weird like moment of leisure or like lunch break where something where because you guys are kind of like, they're supposed to be working for a certain number of hours a day, this, this is some weird sort of, I don't know, space between like work and not work or like working on the project and not working on the project. I'm not sure, but it was interesting. So, um, so anyway, the website, and this is online, it kind of opens the space of the project up and makes it accessible to everyone, not just sort of like um, the people in the building, but also anybody that might go to this online. Um, so, the idea is that during the bi or was that during the biennial, 
thousands of rooms would be sort of contributed by the public to the project and all of them, all the sort of like submitted designs get cataloged and also kind of like averaged together to form a collective design that would one day be built. So it shows a kind of estimated value, labor, all of this is all like calculated for Chicago. Um, and if you don't like it, you can redo it. If you do like it, you can submit it. And um, it basically gets uploaded to the catalog. So um, at the same time as it does that, you've contributed to this sort of like collective average. So what the intent was that at the end of the biennial, we would have built this sort of like thousand, like the average of thousands of user contributed rooms to sort of shift shift some work done on the project to the public to say that, well, this is a sort of public collectively designed thing. So we were interested in not designing the specificity of the thing built, but designing the sort of software that kind of managed and controlled that thing. Um, so anyway, we've been sort of like tracking and accounting for all these submissions. Um, and it, as it obviously turns out, the kind of like, uh, it's much easier to design a room than it is to kind of like draw it, or much quicker. The sort of labor involved in squiggling is much different than the labor involved in um, measuring and um, the sort of forms of architectural description that we're usually used to. Um, so anyway, you can sort of download your design room or anybody's design room. This is just a kind of sample of the things you get if you download a set of drawings. Um, which we thought was somehow moving the project into some idea about do-it-yourself construction and like obvious and weekend warriors, I guess. Uh, so anyway, you get a sort of, what, your sort of materials you need, you get your floor plan um, or some version of a floor plan, not necessarily an architectural one, but one that a general audience might understand um, that they can print out on their eight and a half by 11 printer and sort of, so that's what this is, this is like a tile thing at full scale. This is like what all those sheets look like. Um, you just kind of print them out and lay them out. Um, and then you also get these sort of like instruction sets, I guess, but, um, or I guess what our version of like way, uh, sort of an early concept of what we were thinking about instructional videos. Um, so framing, drywall, again repeated in Sydney um, at an exhibition called Field Work um, that actually Andrew Kovacs and Andrew Atwood or First Office were also part of, so I don't know, LA sort of visited Sydney for a while. But the different, the sort of other way we played this up, instead of a large touch screen in this one, we kind of used, um, we had smaller Microsoft surfaces running the software and we installed a printer on site. And the idea was, though Sydney has like an incredible time difference from us, the idea was, was that we would have office hours. And so the software was sort of set up to only work during certain hours of the day. And we would be at our computer in LA during that time, producing drawings um, sort of live as somebody uploaded their squiggle design. So um, the sort of thing that allowed us to do this, this is sort of one, one of the little stations, was uh, at Google now, like Google Cloud Print. Have you guys used Google Cloud Print? Like you can have your Google account hooked up to any printer anywhere, and if you like log onto it there, and you log onto it where you are, you can sort of print anywhere in the world. So we were in LA, and we were sending prints to the printer here in Sydney for people to sort of like set this thing up in their home, which I don't know. This, so like the whole conversation about BIM and participation, and like like what are the limits of expertise? These are all things that we're sort of like working on and thinking about during the project. Um, so I, th this is a project that was sort of like a competition submission. Um, and it was for the design of like a modular home uh, that took the form of a salt box roof. So it, this project sort of took our interest from the PS1 competition and also some interest about do-it-yourself assembly and framing and tried to sort of force those things into one project. But basically it's sort of yeah, modular, so you get basically, what we did was we took the roof, the form 
of the roof or of a roof and we just put it on the ground um, and kind of nestled them up right against one another just as a very small sort of like living unit. So this is just a section, but the, the whole thing is um, kind of based on, they're all the same, um, they're all framed similarly, but what we got super interested in was the sort of patent drawings of ladders and how um, in how a ladder is something that's always on a construction site, but it's also something that is lightweight enough and provides enough sort of structural stability that on a sort of conceptual level or diagrammatic level might be something that can be not just a like a sort of tool or apparatus used in construction, but also a sort of part of the material of the constructed system. So we were looking a lot at like how people that climb Everest, the Sherpas like set up, set up these ladder paths um, for, for climbers, but they also like use them normally as ladders. So the ladder like begins to take on all, all these sort of like different uses and functions. So the whole system was like an aluminum frame that you could carry on site and, ex and it was a kind of like collapsible ladder that would, could be used like horizontally um, as let's say joists and also uh, in a sort of vertical way as like roof framing and stuff like this. And then the, the end caps were basically just trust. Um, so it sort of, the framing looked like this and then everything was sort of analyzed with the sort of version of corrugated, um, cor very thick corrugated insulated panels um, in the end. But the idea was, was that you're, you didn't, you had this like complete kit, right? Like it was sort of, I guess on some level Ikea, Idea concept, like everything you need, you sort of got it in the, in the box, but everything kind of went into the project itself. Um, so, no waste. Well, this was just the model. Um, and then, because it's modular, it can be sort of like arranged in a number of different configurations from, or expanded to accommodate more or sort of less people. So, there's like a three pack, four pack. Okay, we're gonna try this video. If you, it requires sound and hopefully you guys can hear it. So this is a video-based project. Um, I should say um, my husband, who's also my partner, is not an architect. He wasn't trained as an architect. He went to his background, his undergrads in journalism and graphic design, and then he's got his MFA from Art Center in Media Design. Um, and he teaches at USC and Santa Monica College like graphic design studios and interaction design and web design. So a lot of our work is operating somewhere in the space between well, between architecture and, and that, which is a very sort of new field, I guess, trying to situate itself. Um, and so a lot a lot of things we do rely on video and moving image, and this is is phone, this project is all a video project. Um, and it's very much about communication and making sort of one form of communication fit into another. So it was sort of the first project that Ian and I undertook and developed collectively. It's an ongoing project about the translation from cinematic image to textual description. And the current running time of the video is 33 minutes and 24 seconds, but I'm, we're just gonna watch it a little bit.
to my website and watch it on video. Um, so anyway, basically what's happening in this, we didn't produce any of this, we just compiled it together, so it's all already sort of existing stuff, even the kind of voiceover. Um, and uh, it's, the, I guess I'll explain where it comes from, but it's basically what we were interested in is the kind of like doubling of information or two different formats, right? Text and image, so things that don't necessarily align. So you're seeing an image and you're hearing a description of it at the same time. Um, so I guess questions to us were like, how much information is required to describe in a moving image? What to describe? How do we begin to sort of ascribe value to things um, or visual things? And it calls attention to something that's typically liminal or overlooked, like a bumper. Like these, that's what these things are called. They're things that you see before major motion pictures, the production studios animate these logos. And ultimately what this does is it makes something that was so easy to digest and almost ignore or gloss over. It makes, well for us, makes it more difficult to watch in, in a kind of good way, an interesting way. So this uh, kind of addresses the fidelity between text and image. So what, the way that these things are produced is you kind of have like, a, and it's not, they don't just have these visual descriptions for uh, the bumpers, they exist for entire movies. And it's, uh, you can sort of, I, I think it's primarily DVD based right now, but you can kind of, uh, there are descriptions for visually impaired people. So basically you have a script, um, and then through a lot of work you get a kind of like major motion picture, and what we have, what we understand the kind of like visual description to be is a sort of negative of that or it kind of fills the space in between all that. So you need, it's, if it's only one directional, you kind of need the major motion picture or the bumper in order to produce a description of it. But all of this was sort of put in into effect by an act of Congress in 2010 to increase the access of persons with disabilities to modern communication. Um, so what we did was we took all these bumpers, things that we always watch that we don't normally look at, and we sort of strung them together with their visual um, and so these are just all the sort of sources we've compiled so far. What we've begun to do is turn it back into text by transcribing the visual description. Um, so there's multiple ways that each of the bumpers are described, like one, um, and there's different, there's different sort of voice actors that describe them, but like Touchstone Pictures, if, like the white one, it's the same, or these two, like it's the same bumper you're watching, but they're described different ways by different people. Um, it's not sure, clear to us if the like different sort of who, like who's writing these things, but it's interesting that there's multiple ways to kind of like describe uh, describe the same thing, I guess. Um, so we don't really know what to do with this right now, but it's interesting to us. Like eventually, this is the sort of like double kind of double format or multiple forms of information about the same thing is something we've been sort of thinking about for a while, I guess. Um, and then so this is the last project I'll show. Um, it's like current right now, it's not a building, it's not a video, it's, these are like a series of objects we call props, and they're a series of past terrazzo objects, um, they're doorstops primarily, we thought of them as doorstops, I guess you could think of them as anything you want, um, but the sort of idea of the doorstop has been interesting to us recently because I guess you can go to sort of like Home Depot and buy those little rubber ones, but at UCLA, where I teach, they just sort of appear, like little wooden ones kind of appear out of nowhere, and they also disappear. Like when you need one, you can never find it, but there's always one kind of laying around that when, you, when you don't need it. And so they're sort of anonymous and authorless, typically. Um, and and so, we, and typically like undesigned, right? They're just, they're very utilitarian, right? They're, they're wedge-shaped so they can sort of fit under any height door. Um, but if they're too, low, if they're not steep enough, then they then the door just sort of closes, and if they're too high, then you can't really wedge them underneath. So anyway, we started to think about the door stop as a kind of design object, and the terrazzo was a sort of like funny thing for us because it, it's incredibly labor intensive. The materials are quite cheap, it's just cement and marble and glass, but you have to grind it for a very, very long time. So we're doing all the grinding in our office, but um, it's the least economical material you could pro probably use. So there was a sort of like misalignment between something that nobody really owns and nobody produces, like a doorstop, and something that's like requires a whole lot of like hands and work and all this stuff, like terrazzo, which has a long history in buildings that um, was, I guess, for some time was thought of as like 
you would just, you know, kind of like use remnant ceramics and stuff like that in the floor, and it was it's quite durable and all this stuff. But then recently, like if you walk through downtown LA in the jewelry district, the, there's incredibly elaborate patterns. So it's like something that's become a kind of like artisanal, high sort of luxury craft. Anyway, um, door stops, bookends. But the, also like the reason, I guess, why they're called props. Um, so there's like some reference to Richard Serra's early work, but they they obviously prop up other things, but they're also kind of just like, they're anonymous, but kind of like in the background, right? Passive objects, I guess, that we were sort of interested in. And they come in four sizes. Actually, five sizes. We also make a parking chop, which is like these things you, for your car, um, so high, high, high item parking chop. Um, anyway, uh, so we're having a launch party at MoGA downtown next Thursday from 6 to 8. You guys want to come go with the music and refreshments um, for, the, for the props. And they're also available online. But they're, they're sort of just dumb objects that we hope can end up in many people's homes and just, I guess, take something that's typically sort of found in the background and give, sort of bring it to the playground. Um, that's it.